All right, so the narrow way jungle outpost. And this picture that you see currently is actually a picture of the river on the outpost that we have, that God has um, blessed us to be able to um, walk on. All right, so to this evening, our testimony is going to take the, this form. The objects, objectives for this is what is an outpost what is the purpose for an outpost and basically what is a seventy adventist outpost where did the outpost idea start for us and um some of the preparations and trials that we went through in that process and how god led us directly to the property okay so first question what is an outpost? But before we continue, I'd like to say another word of prayer um, as my husband joins us so that we can. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> you, know, I... you can just pull this. Okay. Right. So my husband can join us. So you go ahead and pray for us to start. Father, I want to thank you for your general opportunity where we get to minister. Lord, we pray that to be first. Guide our actions, guide our words, but may everything that we say and do be pleasing your sight and may it be according to your will. I mean, the heirs that need to have will understand that their role in this just my prayer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So what is an outpost? And to do this, to find out, let me just like give you a little bit there. Okay. I decided to go and find out the the um the meaning of the word outpost and this is what i was able to find a small military camp or position at some distance from the main force used especially to guard against surprise, surprise attacks yeah. okay so one of the things that came to mind was is this something that we all we need and what does that have to do with us today and what could it possibly be why would this information help us to find out about god's outpost so one of the things that i found out god has asked us to set up an outpost mm -hmm. to some extension Amir, the definition that we gave has something to do with what the outpost is mm -hmm. but then how so? We are in a great controversy of good and evil, whether we want to be there or not. Okay. There is a spiritual battle taking place and God has asked his children to have their forces ready. We do not fight against flesh and blood or principalities or powers. So we understand that there is a battle taking place. So question. What would you find in an outpost? Trained soldiers, okay. food, mm -hmm. shelter, the weapons, um, equipment, okay. all of those things are things that you would find in an outpost. Now, what does that have to do with where we are and what outpost is about? So an outpost is like a military installation Away from the main one, something. Yes, yeah. so okay. it's a little distance from the main one, and it's especially um, needed for attack um, and um, to prevent surprise attacks. So then the okay. main, the main um, um, camp or the main um, battle um, soldiers would be a little distance away, but the outpost or the fort, would you say, would be up front. And they would be a little bit more visible mm -hmm. and they would be um, ready for surprise attacks. Okay. So based on Ephesians 6 verse 12, we see, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what the well, this is what we know that we're up against. Mm -hmm. Now, so we're not fighting man. Because... No, we're not. Okay. Now, when Jesus was on earth, what, how did that help? 
when Jesus was on earth, how did that help? And how was that? How did he deal with? Um, how did he deal with um, um, these um, spiritual um, situations? On earth, we can find out from Matthew 4, verse 23, um, what Christ did on earth and what his approach was. And Jesus went about for all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases. So that's one thing that Jesus did while he was on earth. He was teaching, he was preaching, and he was healing. Okay? These are some of the things that Jesus did on earth. So while the spiritual battle was going on, Jesus was doing those three things. So that's very important for us to take note of. Okay, so Matthew 25, 34 to 36 says, then all the king says unto them, and this is what God expects from his children. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was an hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty and he gave me drink. I was a stranger and he took me in naked and he clothed me. I was sick. And he visited me. I was in prison and he came unto me. Whoa. So in preaching, teaching, and healing, God expects his children to feed the hungry. Loving the brother. Yeah, be very loving. Feed the hungry, the thirsty, clothe the naked, be um, there for the stranger, mm -hmm. the ones in prison. Jesus expects us to be loving and these are some of the ways that we can express that love so i'd like to um i'd like to share a little bit about where this started for us um i remember and when i was about 18 years old i was i was praying and just asking god for you know, clarity of mind and to understand a little bit more about what he desires for the world. And I remember I was in my teens when God showed me a beautiful place. That place, it looks like an orphanage to me. And there were children in a garden and there seemed to be a school close by because there were teachers outside teaching the children in the garden and for me this was something very new I had never seen anything like this before I'd never um, been exposed to any of um, anything like that so I was excited I saw there were so many children and the parents seemed to be close by as well um, I remember there was a chapel like on top of the hill, like perched on a the side. There was a chapel or a meeting hall and everybody just seemed to be so happy and joyous, just going about their business. There was persons in the cafeteria and the workers lived on property. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was like an estate. There were orchards. The colors were just so beautiful. You could walk around and, and, the green grass, there was like a pond. And let me tell you, the place was just so beautiful. I remember so walking beautiful. in. I remember walking into um, wow, it sounds like I was there. <laughs> um, in, in in that little dream, I walked into the, the art studio and it was, it had a view, and there were okay, children. Yeah. I still remember the things. Uh, yeah, and there were children actually drawing and, mm -hmm. and painting. And some of the children were um single parent children yes and this was just so beautiful and i remember um when i met my husband i shared all of that with him and i remember saying to him love we were sitting around the, the lighthouse area mm -hmm. there and just looking down at all of the the buildings lower down and i remember saying to him giving him the details of that vision that god had given me and i remember he sat there and he said 
do you know how much um, work, how long you'd have to work to um, be able to afford an estate that size? I said, I have no idea. But God asked Abraham to leave his home to a place that he'd show him. Uh, I'm sure he didn't have to pay for it. But if, if, he, if he did, and if God wants us to, to set up this, mm -hmm. this, what he's shown, he will surely accomplish his will. He would yeah. have to provide the land. Yeah, you said God would give us land. Yes, I said God would give us the land for that if he wants <laughs> us to start that. Uh, I, I wanted to say like, um, what? what? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. That could work. Yep, I remember that very, yeah. very clearly. So um, these were some of the things that, that we saw and I remember what cemented this particular vision in my mind was while I was still a teenager there was a young or there's a camp that we went to and there was a young um, girl at that camp who was well she got pregnant out of wedlock and she was like she was a teenager and the other girls did not really treat her very nicely. Um, all, you know, she wasn't treated very well and the girls were just being very mean to her. And of course, parents didn't necessarily want their children to necessarily interact with her because, um, I mean, she's pregnant, she's a teenager and who would even, like, how did, could this even happen? And so um, no one wanted to sleep next to her in the camp because it's an all girls room, but all of the sleeping bags and sleeping mats are- So it was like pregnancy or something? No, it's just that you just, you just- Oh, your parents told you don't sleep with girl. I don't think it was that. It could be, but it wasn't, it was just one reason to segregate somebody. Oh, yeah. I think that was just it. And um, I remember at that camp, I put my sleeping mat right next to hers. And I said, Lord, I'm going to befriend this young lady in this camp because she has nobody else. Everybody's treating her meanly. And yes, she made a, a mistake, but is this really the end? And um, I remember one evening praying as I, I, I as she was, she was, next to my, my my camping mass and she was there sleeping and I remember praying and asking God Lord you need to provide this place that you showed me this location would really really help persons like her who didn't finish school who who don't know what to do they can get an opportunity to learn a trade while learning about um, your love and how much you care and you know, her, her, her child would have a place that she could stay and learn too. You would teach, she would be able to learn and she would be able to, there would be teachers there to teach her how to be a better parent. And, mm -hmm. you know, for her to learn the, the, the work that you would have her to learn and to feel the love mm -hmm. from, from you. Instead of from, from a guy that went to that Yeah. So... I saw this as, Lord, you can break the cycle. You can bring healing. You have done this before. All you need to do is just to set up this beautiful place that you showed me. And this would be such a help to um, um, the, the society. How long ago was that? That was like a long time ago. I was still in my teenage years when that okay. happened. And I remember my life after that was quite like focused. Um, a couple years from it. So, um, what was God's method of reaching the people? He gained their trust and met their needs. This is his approach to reaching um, those in need. And I remember after that experience, as we, as we grew, we decided to be like, Lord, we want to become missionaries. We know this is what you wanted, you wanted for us. And that's probably why you, you, you desired for us to have this, this beautiful location. At the time, I did not know it was an outpost. Um, but as we, we grew, as I grew older, and even in, 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 um, in getting married, 
this was still my main focus. God is going to provide an outpost here in St. Lucia. And um, when I started learning even more and more about God's methods, I realized that the vision that I had so long ago was actually an outpost. Mm -hmm. So what is basically the Seventh-day Adventist blueprint outpost? Because I gave the definition of what an outpost, a military, a military outpost is, mm -hmm. but then what does it pertain, what is, what is it as it pertains to um, us mm -hmm. as Seventh-day Adventist spiritual? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is one of the um, photos that I love to use to help explain exactly what an outpost is and how it pertains to us and its purpose and how it works. And I remember when I started learning about this, I was amazed at how God could have provided such detail in the, just this small um, enterprise or small facilities. So let me just read a little bit about what the outpost is all about. Okay, so I'm going to be reading from um, evangelism. The medical missionary work is a door through which the truth is to find entrance to many homes in the city. The gospel ministry is needed to give put permanence and stability to the medical missionary work. And the ministry needs the medical missionary work to demonstrate the practical workings of the gospel. Neither part of the work is complete without the other. And as we can, if we, if we remember, we saw that Jesus did teaching, preaching, and healing. Preaching, teaching, and healing. So the medical missionary work would be the healing aspect of, of God's work. And if you look at the, the, um, the layout that we have, this would fall in the lifestyle center. The lifestyle center would be where the medical missionary work would take place, where we use natural remedies to facilitate the restoration of persons who have lifestyle diseases or suffering from ailments that they um, cannot necessarily, have not necessarily find um, a solution to what is causing. And what we understand from the medical missionary work is that the eight laws of health are the laws that God has given us for a healthy body, mm -hmm. a healthy mind, um, and a, um, to be um, holistically um, healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So this is the lifestyle center. And the outpost is basically this um, web mm -hmm. with this with the center of the web. Yes. So the sense every every aspect of the 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 facility would be assisting in one area or the next because we understand that Jesus requires us to meet the needs of of persons. All right. Okay. So. Okay. okay. So I'm going to um, let you know a little bit more about the other aspects. So if we could see there's a lifestyle center, there is a training or educational facility, there's a food factory, there's a publishing house, and there's agriculture. And all of these um, institutions come together to form the outpost facility, which intends to bring the gospel message into all the world. And not only that, but mm -hmm. to meet the needs and to train disciples, mm -hmm. to train missionaries. And there's a quote that comes to mind, no, no other way, but Jesus' way, I think, is the way. Ah, I forgot how it goes. Yes, Jesus' method alone. Yes, Jesus', Jesus method alone. Yes. Yeah, but well, that's the point. Okay, so Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 234. Centers of Influence may be established in many places 
by the opening up of health food stores, hygiene restaurants, and treatment rooms. Mm. So this is where we connect the outpost, which is out into the out in the country, to the persons in the city by using the the um, food, the hygiene restaurants, and the treatment rooms. Okay, in every in every important place, there should be a dispository for publications. So that is where we have literature to be able to share with persons exactly what they can do to live a healthier and holistic life. And this on this is just the entering wedge, as we saw earlier. In connection with our city mission, there should be suitable rooms where those who in those in whom an interest has been awakened can gather for instruction. This necessary work is not to be carried on in such a meager way that is unfavorably imp impressed. Infavorable impressions okay. will be made to the mind of people. Mm. All that is done should properly represent the sacredness and importance of the truth of the third angel's messages. So the outpost center, and I have another picture there for us to just take a look at, and then we can um, go between the two. So we can look at this picture. And this can give us a little bit more of a visual of what the outpost center might, does, look, might look like or a country, the country aspect of the outpost. Because the outpost, as we saw, has both the, the okay. outpost mm -hmm. or the country location, mm -hmm. and it also has the city outreach. Mm -hmm. Now, in the country locations, we saw that there was a lifestyle center. Mm -hmm. We saw that there was agriculture, mm -hmm. a publishing house. Mm -hmm. We saw there were food factories and there was a place for training or education. Mm -hmm. So these are what we find in the country. And we, of course, need to reach the cities from our post centers. So we need some form of a connection in the cities to reach those in the, um, to reach those in the country. To reach those in the city, sorry. Okay, so here we see that the city missions entail doing house to house. There's the treatment rooms, there's the church, there is also the restaurants. Now let us take a view at uh, outposts in the country. So here we see with number 17, that could be the, the, the agricultural aspect. We can see number three, if persons can look here, can be the main hall where persons um, meet, where there is worship, where there could be church and other aspects, where there could be Bible studies, classes, and so on. There is a parking lot where everywhere persons come when they are um, coming to the outpost. There is a place where persons can get the books and the publications that they need as well. And if you notice, the farm or the agricultural aspect is very big because it is not only for feeding of those who live on the outpost, but it is also to be a way of feeding those outside as well. So we see here that this is an ideal location for God's work to take place, for the teaching, healing, and preaching work and making of disciples to take place. The educational facility would be um, also on this particular um, piece as well. So as we, uh, I haven't read the quotas yet, but agriculture is one of the things that is our ABC of education. So having those farms, it's not only to bring in income to facilitate the operations of the outpost but it also required it's also required to have um persons learn a little bit more about the work okay so we'll go into the a little bit about the welfare work 
poverty and distress. And this is something that we have noticed in St. Susha. Poverty and distress in families will come to our knowledge and afflicted and suffering ones will have to be relieved. We know very little of the human suffering that exists everywhere about us. But as we have opportunity, we should be ready to render immediate assistance to those who under a severe pressure. And that is Welfare Ministries, page 137. This is something else that we always want to do. We want to be in a position that we can meet the needs. Where there are families in need, we want to be able to help. And especially in St. Lucia, um, I have had experiences where I can see that there is so much a need for the outpost. I remember we met, we were on the beach one, one time and we saw a little boy around my son's age. He was my son was six at the time. And the little boy was running and he had a big burn on the side of his leg. And I was, and then some guys were running after him and then they caught him and he was trying to wrestle his way out. And so we were, we were shocked and we, we approached the situation and um, the guys were like, no, 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 no. We just, I'm um, trying to catch him so we can send him home to his mother. And a little while long, a little while um, we saw the mother coming in and she was like, I've been looking for you all day. You keep jumping out the house and just going and, and, and begging on the streets. And I've been looking for you. Why do you do that? I, I, I cannot take this anymore. And I remember just standing there and the, he was the same height of my son. And I could see the same age of my son, but he looked so grown. In his eyes, you could see that he had lived life. He had a huge burn from his waist all the way down to his leg. And I was like, Lord, there is such a need. And I remember she, she came and she's like, well, yeah, we don't have all of the money, but we, I always, I try to give him food every day, but he still tries to, to leave the house and, and do his own thing. And I just cannot imagine what to do with him next. I tried to lock the house for him not to be able to jump out, but he still leaves. And I keep thinking, looking at that boy, that he's going to grow up and just replicate that cycle. And I'm like, Lord, at what point are we going to to do something about it, to make a, a change in those people's lives. Dear, dear Lord, I remember praying that night and saying, Lord, do something so that your children don't have to suffer. So when I think of the outpost, I think of having food enough that after everybody, after the, the school mm. facility, facilities are taken care of, and there's produce shared, that there is still some left over to, for us to go house to house in the city missions to provide a means of food for persons who just cannot afford to do anything else. And what better way to bring the gospel to someone, but to bring a basket of fresh provisions with the message and saying that Jesus loves you. So this is something that um, has been a burden on our hearts for, for, for a very long time. And we're so excited to let you know how God has taken us from that country location to actually um, this um, location that he's soon um, going to establish. Okay, so God, I'm reading from uh, the book Evangelism. God is calling not only ministers, but also upon the physicians and the nurses called porters, Bible workers, and other consecrated laymen of various talents who have a knowledge of the word of God and who know the power of his grace to consider the needs of the unwanted cities. Time is rapidly passing and there is much to be done. Every agency must be set in operation that presents opportunities, that present opportunities may use wisely, may be wisely improved. And one of the things that God has been able to show 
us living in St. Lucia is that there is a need. There are not very many um, self-supporting ministries to aid the local churches in bringing the message into all the world or to meeting the needs, the various needs of all the, the, the persons and the communities that are suffering, especially now in COVID where many have lost their jobs and many do not know what to do. We see the dire need for the outpost here in St. Lucia. We see the dire need for the organic produce and to also teach farmers how to produce healthful foods for their families and of course the wider, the, the wider public. I remember when we went for our, our farmer's license and we would, they were in the section on pesticides and the instructor was stressing on how cancer had risen so much in the Caribbean and especially in St. Lucia. And one of the things that they um, believe was causing that was having such heavy, heavy chemicalized foods in the market. And that the government would have to start doing something to prevent um, two um, um, heavy chemicalized foods to reach on the shelves. And I remember thinking to myself, Lord, Lord, your institution is so needed because we know how to farm without these harmful pesticides. Lord, when you set up this location, we can be teaching farmers how to do this um, more effectively so that we can grow with nature and not against nature. And we can help with also how we eat so that we do not cause or create the problem of lifestyle um, diseases such as cancer. So these are some of the things that, some of the needs that we've been seeing as we go along. And as we see those needs, we have been praying and praying and saying, Lord, you have to provide this place. Yes, we are a small island. Yes, um, our population is very small, but Lord, you did not forget us. You did not forget that you still have children. You were not willing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 righteous. There must be those in St. Lucia who would stand faithful, who needs to have this work to set up this virgin mission field as St. Lucia. So this has been um, our prayer as we um, been moving forward and praying for the outpost. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about our, the sanitarium. So I was giving, I was just looking at a picture and I stressed a lot about the agricultural aspect where it would, it is a very good means of one, teaching farmers also about how to farm properly. So those are some of the lectures that can be provided as well as the health lectures. The lifestyle center or sanitarium should be a means of the medical missionary work bring, bringing persons to the gospel, to understand the three angels message, to understand what God intended for us holistically. The training school or the education facility would be a means of training missionaries in a trade, in the medical missionary work, in, the, in Bible work, and of course, in meeting the needs of, of the community. The food factory will basically be taking the agricultural produce and creating products that would be easy for um, persons to, to use. So for example, in the, in, in the farm, you may have nutmeg or you may have a particular herb. And in the food factory, you can take that herb or you can take that um, particular um, item and turn it into a packaged good that can be sold. And this would be something that would be a form of income for the outpost. So I'm just sharing the holistic um, mission of the outpost and how it is, um, how God intends to use it. So what is the outpost? Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers. In these cities, we are to have houses of worship as memorial for God, 
but institution for publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick, and for the training of our workers are to be established outside the cities, especially is it important that our youth be shielded from the temptation of the cities. And of course, what a better place. And as I started reading and learning more about the outpost, I realized how much God had put into this blueprint that he gave us as Stephanie Adventists, this beautiful picture of bringing health, the health message to the world, to bring a holistic transformation and restoration, not only physically, but spiritually as well, to bring that gospel, that transforming power through our Savior Jesus Christ to us. So after our praying, after our, our agonizing with God, and I remember I would stay up late and I would agonize with God. I would remind him that he promised that he would provide this particular center in St. Lucia. That he had provided them in, in the US and in the UK and in Australia, but he, but he needed to have one in St. Lucia to have this um, island to be evangelized as I said, from outpost centers. So I remember one time um, I decided, we, my husband and I decided to speak and we said, maybe we should just both go to work. Because at this point we were living in the country and um, we were um, seeking to, 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 we were homeschooling our son and we were just thinking that the outpost is so desperately needed. Every day that we we, we meet people, we we worked in a um, a school for for rad girls at some point. And the more we saw the need, the more we got in our needs and prayed. And I remember one one evening we said, "Love, if we both go to work, we're both very skilled individuals. If we just both go to work and just make the money, we'll be able to buy the land and just we could really start this work. And I remember saying, well, the Lord asked us to, to homeschool. So I don't know, you know, maybe we shouldn't be able to do that. And then, I, then um, we were saying, but it won't be just be for, it won't be for a long time. It just be for a short period of time, just for us to make enough money between the two of us, me being a manager, he being a, a contractor, we can, we can really bring that money in. So what we did, um, I remember we, we spoke about that for about a week and uh, there was one um, morning that we woke up and we went downstairs to his shop and we had been robbed. All my husband's tools were gone. And I remember coming upstairs, sitting down in our worship, um, our, our small worship area. I'm thinking, Lord, the house is not finished as yet. There's so much work to be done. How can you allow those important tools to be stolen? And we just sat there in silence for some time. And I remember my husband said, I think I understand why he did it. Everything happens for a reason. And I think the reason for that is because of the conversations we were having about sending our son to school and uh, both of us going to work. And I remember he said, um, after worship, we, we worshiped that that morning. And he said, Lord, if your lesson to us is that we, one of us always needs to stay home with our son for homeschooling then I would, if that is the lesson that you're trying to teach us, because everything happens for a reason, um, I'd like you to, I'd like you to, and make, give us back all those tools, because we still need them. Give us back the tools. Yeah. So give us back the tools. I remember when um, we prayed that prayer, we prepared that prayer in the morning. We're about to leave to go, go somewhere. And um, we prayed that prayer that God would give us back those tools that morning. And we got in the vehicle, packed our stuff, and we started driving down the road. And we live on, on about three acres. So after we got a little lower down to one of our neighbors, and she's like, hold up, hold up. My, my gardener found something in the, 
in the in on the end of my property somewhere down there it's like it really hidden with some tarpaulin and stuff over it can you can you go check it out with him i think it has some some stuff in there that um is definitely not ours so my husband left and he went down with the gardener to the um end of the property and to our amazement all my husband's tools were there now it was not only my husband's tools that were stolen but the prayer the morning was lord if the if what you're trying to tell us is we're not going to have to go to work to see how we can put our son to school and um, the both the two of us go to work to bring in some money so to um back purchase this a uh, piece of land for us to start this outpost if this is your if you're trying to tell us no for that and the reason for allowing the tools to be stolen was to ensure that we don't do that. We like the tools back that morning. And all the tools were found that morning. And I was like, Lord, we get it. We get it. We get it. We understand what you're saying. I, we're not having this conversation again. We know where, you're, where, you're, you're, where you stand and we're not going to do this again. And we, then we prayed, Lord, we would like the rest of the stuff these too, not just the tools, but the other things that were stolen, we would like to have them as well. And um, I remember when it was some time, a little time after, where we heard some hellos coming onto our property. There was a man and there was a young girl that I had, um, that I remembered and a boy. And that was the person that actually stole our stuff. He was coming back to bring the stuff and apologize for stealing, for stealing it. And in, when he came over and, you know, he apologized for, for, for taking the stuff and um, we prayed with him and um, he said what really got him to um, bring the stuff back and to come and apologize was the fact that we had, his mother explained to him that the people that he had stole those things from had saved his daughter, had saved his daughter's life some time ago. And I have to give you that, 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 that was the reason why I remembered that particular young lady. She was actually, there was one um, afternoon, Sabbath afternoon that we were actually going down the road to watch the sunset by the beach with a friend of ours and there was a little bit of a ruckus in a house with a girl trying to commit suicide and I remember my friend he had his charcoal um I don't know he had a charcoal um um tablets in his in his sub in his kits and he had his um first aid kit on him and I remember um we had we we prayed with the family. There was the siren outside. People were crying. We prayed with the family. There were, um, the, the ambulance was there for a little while, but they left. But we stayed and we prayed with the family and asked if the girl was okay. And we left some of the charcoal um, tablets with them. And I just explained to them what it was and um, how it could assist if she had ingested anything. And if she, could, if she did do it again, that that could be something that they could use even before the ambulance got there. So we did the whole explanation. We prayed with the family. We stayed a little longer and we stayed in connection with, um, well, we stayed in connection with the family. So um, through that particular experience, the father of that particular young lady coming and apologizing because he, be, he saw that his daughter's life was, was saved because of the same people that he had stolen from. God allowing this to happen showed us that the little that we were trying to do, even without the outpost, even without the, the lifestyle center, even without the facilities to help with the rehabilitation of persons mentally, spiritually, and physically, that he was still doing a work. He was still doing a work. I remember um, speaking to this young lady and letting her know that God has something special for her to do. God has something special, a special work. And yes, she, she would cry. And her, her dad was a, 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 a thief and her mom was, was, on, was on some 
was not the best and she was living with her grandmother and it didn't seem like life was ever going to get better. But in that moment, we were able to share a little bit about God's love with her. And these are the things that we want to expand on. These are the things that so many medical missionaries in St. Lucia have done training for and seek to start working in an established outpost to do God's work because it's so desperately needed in St. Lucia. We are one of the virgin um, missionary fields ripe for the harvest and we know that God is going to send the workers and send the 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 people um, to help do that work so let me share a little bit about how God led us to this place so after much praying and much agonizing and going through basically wrestling with God and saying Lord you have forgotten your children in St. Lucia one um one, one morning in prayer, God, God, it's just a still small voice. He was like, you can stop praying for the, for the land now. The land is already there. It's already settled. And I remember saying, but Lord, at least show it, show it to us. If it's there, you need to show it to us early so that we can go on it, start planting the trees. Lord, I mean, these things take time and we need to start doing your work. And he's like, yes, it has, it has fruit trees. I don't want you to worry about anything about the land. What I want you to, to be concerned about is getting ready to do the work, getting ready and getting the tools and the things you need that's needed to start doing the work. I don't want you to be worried about the land that is on me. And I remember when God said that, I was excited. I'm like, love, you know, like I basically, I finally got like a, a, a step. We got a step forward. God said like, you know, he has the land that he would provide the land for the outpost. And we were excited about that. Until there was one day he said to us that he'd want us to see the land. And I was excited. I was ecstatic. And then he told my husband that we had seen it. We'd seen a, 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 a listing of it already and I should we should go back to that listing that we had just brushed aside and I was thinking like Lord what 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 listing was that and then I remembered the listing it was for a large property um about 200 acres of land and I mean the price on that was just outside of our range outside of our reach and so we never just we just never looked at it and I remember I said I want you to go back and look and, and take up that 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 listing and I'm like Lord I mean really that I mean I guess okay I mean it's always nice to travel and see different places and new places so I guess if if, if that's what you would like us to do then that's fine so um that there's well, that day my husband and I we decided to to go to find that place the only picture that we had of the place was like some pictures of some bamboo that was taken some i'm guessing a long time ago when the listing was added um so we were like how are we going to find this place how are we going to find this place yes we know the general area that is it, it's in but that area is like miles like how could you find a particular area we don't even know the name of the the location so I remember we went into the area and we tried describing the place to the people like it has a river it's like it's really green it has bamboo everybody's like okay try this road oh and then try this one and after going in many wrong roads we were like my husband was like love God is the one who asked us to go there if he is the one that's going to show us the property we should as well ask him and my husband prayed at that moment. And he's like, Lord, you asked us, you said you're going to take us to see the location that you had for the outpost. So here we are. We don't know where it is. Guide us. And my husband said he had a strong impression to take a particular road. I had never even noticed it before. And we took that road and we started driving down. And I remember so clearly we saw, a, while we were driving down, we saw a red van and there was a a guy with a hat that says, God is my boss. And he was just um, leaning on the van. Um, I'm guessing just taking in the view. And I remember my husband said, this is somebody that we need to speak to. I mean, 
if Jesus is his boss and we're following and Jesus is supposed to be taking us to see a place, he's, he should be somebody that we could speak to. And I remember we stopped and we spoke to this, um, this gentleman and he, we started giving him a little bit of that um, description of what we were looking for. I was like, I think, yeah, you might be in the right gap, but you, you can't get there. That place is not accessible. You can't really get there. And so you could as well turn back now. Um, it's like, nah, you know, you don't get there. It, yes, it does have, yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about, but you can't get there. And I remember um, I said, okay, well, no problem. Thank you so much. And um, we kept on going. And we were like, Lord, you said you take us here. Um, somebody says we can't reach there. By the time the vehicle can go, if the vehicle stops at some point and we have to use our feet, then that's fine. But you said you're taking us and we're going all the way unless you've said stop. And we started to walk. We started to drive, sorry. And every time there was a turn in the road, my husband knew he would pray and the Holy Spirit would impress him exactly where to, to what to road to take. And we, keep, we kept driving and the place was just so beautiful and so green and the river was so amazing, just driving up to the property. And um, when we got... I mean, we got some, a couple of places where the vehicle seemed like it was going to stick, but I'm like, love, we're going, we are going. If it has to stick here, it's going to stick here, but we are going until we get to this particular property that God is showing us. And he's going to let us know when we have to stop. So um, we got to a place where we could no longer go with the vehicle. And then we started walking in and then my husband saw the bamboo and I didn't to me, bamboo is just bamboo. But when he saw, there was a particular set of bamboo that he saw. And he's like, this, this is the place. This is the place. And I remember both he and my son just raised their hands in the air and said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for taking us to see this place. It is so beautiful. Yes, it is full of forest. And I remember my husband had asked for a certain trees that he wanted on the property. And to walk by and see those trees there. Yes, they were heavily forested and very covered because it was an old abandoned estate. And, um, and it was basically the remnants of an estate. And I remember walking through it and just smiling and then just going and sit by the river and walking. And God told me that, you know, th th inside of here, there is water that you can drink. And in St. Lucia, there are not many rivers that you can drink the water from. So or, or um, springs or those things. And when God said that, I was I walked with a bottle. I said, love, I'm walking for empty bottle because I need to get that water that God says that is running in there that I can drink. And I remember taking off my shoes and just putting my feet on the ground and we sat there and we prayed. And we said, Lord, this is your place. And we are dedicating it to your work and to your cause. Um, and he said, to us all right now you're gonna go speak to the owners and i'm like what lord no that i'm we, we're praying and all but how do we speak to to the owners of a place where the numbers on the screen are more numbers than we've seen for some time now and you did not allow us to go to work to to work for any long period of time for us to be able to make any substantial amount of money so that we could even consider putting a, pay, a down payment on this property but God said, my child, I need you to speak to all the owners. And um, even before I tell you that testimony, let me show you um, just a little bit of footage of us as we walked through the property to look at um, where God had... Um, moved us to. So let me just share my screen and then I will give you a testimony of um, speaking to the owners. So I believe everybody can see my screen. Um, this is the this is the bamboos that we saw when we, we were walking in. And the place is very, it's very fertile. It's very forested. 
But listen, I love to see bamboo just on the two sides hanging in. And there were so many areas with those bamboo going through the property. Because the, it has been abandoned for so long, the road was actually very, very grassy. But as we continued walking all the way in, there were these really tall trees. And the place that we're walking actually has concrete on it. But because of the heavy leaf fall, you can't really see the road, but it goes all the way down to a beautiful river. And we walk to that place and there's just a mist in the air and the beauty of the trees. And the, the, the majesty of some of the, the trees inside of there were just amazing. And I remember looking at um, a breadfruit leaf and saying, Lord, look at the size of that leaf inside of there. This, these, these breadfruits are really huge. And we're like, Lord, you are providing a place that is so, so full of not just the, the fruit trees, but the, like my husband says, the, the cottages are right there. They just have leaves on it. <laughs> so um, every time we, 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 we look at the, 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 we started looking at the, the size of the fruits that were, that's nutmeg. And we're saying, Lord, isn't that just amazing that you can provide things? And the ones at our, at our place in Sufra are much smaller than those. So when we saw it, we were like, we felt like Caleb and Joshua coming back with the grapes that were huge and hanging on our shoulder. And um, that's just one of the tributaries that leads to the bigger river. So on the property actually has um, tributaries um, that lead to a main river, which is also um, on the property as well. So I remember sitting there and um, because it was like, like I said, an old abandoned estate, you would walk in and see, like my husband is eating a golden apple. So you'd be able to walk by and get a golden apple that's, that's, that just fell or that's, you scavenged it underneath the tree. And we just sat there and we were amazed. And we just listened and the quiet. And then there were the birds, the parrots that would, would fly by as well. And we, we just sat there for some time and just were in awe of how God could have preserved a place for his work so pristine. And I'm telling you this because in St. Lucia, our, our rivers are not that pristine. All of, all of them. We don't have such big rivers. That was basically one of the, um, the very few I had seen in such a beautiful condition. So we sat there and seen the lift, the, the bamboo on the floor and going through the river. That was just a blessing um, for us. So that's one of the tributaries we had just walked down and we were watching the river flow by. So these were some of the, this was the, the, the property that we, we, we had enjoyed walking through. And 
that God has set aside to do his work and to start this beautiful place that he had, had shown us. And I remember when God asked us to, to speak to the owners, one of the first things we said was, Lord, how can we speak to the, the owners? We have no money and we don't even know who they are and how are we going to reach them? And um, God, God asked us to, 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 to find them. And listen to me, this was like finding a needle in a haystack because um, we found um, one, a document with, I'm guessing the old, um, one of the, the most, um, the oldest of their, their ancestors. And so we had to basically find a, create a, a tree, a ancestry tree to be able to locate each and every one of them. And I remember in trying to find, I think we'd found at least five of them. There were six or seven. And I remember when we looked at the document and we saw a spelling of the, the person's name, I'm like, love, I, I don't know. I really give up because I don't even see what's the point of this. Why are we going to speak to so many people? We don't even have all the money is yet. What are we doing? And my husband was looking at one of the names. I was like, that name is spelled wrong. I'm like, how do you know that name is spelled wrong? That's the only document we have. How do you know his name is spelled wrong? It's like, no, that name, it just, uh, just God is impressing me that name, that particular name that I've been looking for for weeks now, that, is pretty, that particular name is spelled wrong. So I'm like, okay, if it's spelled wrong, what's the correct spelling? And he went, he went through, and he's like, ah, I think I found her on Facebook. I'm like, these are older people. How could you tell me, older people, they're not on Facebook. And he's like, I have found her, this is her. I remember when my husband brought me the picture, I'm like, uh, we've been looking so long and then for you to, for you to be impressed that it, the name was spelled wrong and this is the right person, I don't know. But I said, I'll just send a message just in case. And I did, I sent a message too, I sent a message. And the person called me back and she's like, hi, yes, um, I am um, such and such. And yes, this is my dad and this is um, my cousin. And she started just going on and on. And I was, I was so in awe that she was speaking. And I was like, what? <laughs> Lord, you, you? <laughs> like, that is just amazing. And um, we, we were able to speak to, to all of them and, um, I remember one of them, the agent actually saying, it's finally good to have um, some persons that can understand and have the love for nature and the love for education because we, we ex they wanted to have this place as a place that could stay as, it's pres as pristine and natural as possible, but to be a means of sharing um, the knowledge of the trees and the, the natural environment. So they really wanted persons that would appreciate it. And they wanted persons that would be off grid to be there because they knew from the time you bring in too many stuff in there, you're going to just lose the essence of the place. And when they learned that we were living off, off grid and we had lived that way for seven years. And as we continued to share with them, they were like, would you like the rest of the, 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 the properties that we own? So you just added to what you have already, um, the ones you were considering. And I remember saying, Lord, <laughs> I know you're all excited about this, but just remember you, you were just two people <laughs> and you, you sent us to do something and we don't even know the full picture that you have in store. So can you shed some light on this? <laughs> and we prayed and we prayed and we asked, Lord, give us a sign. What are we to do? And he said, go forward. I remember it clearly, go forward. And I, let me see if I can um, bring back the, the, the quotes that he, he shared with us for that particular um, time when he said go forward. And I remember I was, I was nervous and I was like, Lord, this is not, um, this is not, this is real life. <laughs> this is not, this is not, a, this is not, um, um, 
this is not, I, I couldn't help but say, but I know this it happened in Bible times, but Lord, this is real. This is real life. Um, um, you are asking us to do something. We really need to know it was you. Okay, so let me just read a little um, passage. We, and that is taken from um, Christian Experience, page 277. Christian Service, sorry. And it reads, we are to have an educated faith that will not hesitate to follow his instructions in the most difficult experiences. Go forward is the command of God to his people. Faith and cheerful obedience are needed to bring the Lord's designs to pass. When he points out the necessity of establishing the work in places where it will have influence, the people, the people are to walk and work by faith. I was like, Lord, this is a lot. This is a lot. I, I need I need some more counsel, Lord. I, I need to, you Lord, this is hard. This is real life for us. And um he shared some more, more quotations that was really encouraging to us. To, to same okay, to make no move that calls for the investment of means unless we have the money in hand to complete the contemplated work should not always be considered the wisest plan. In the building up of his work, the Lord does not always make everything plain before his servants. He sometimes tries the confidence of his people by having them move forward in faith. Often he brings them to straight and trying places, bidding them to go forward when their feet seems to be touching the water of the Red Sea. It is at such times when the prayers of his servants ascend to him in earnest faith that he opens the way before them and brings them out into a large place. I, I said to myself, Lord, this for sure is a large place. And what you, you're seeking to do is, is a large thing that you're working on. So if you want us to go forward, Lord, we will. I need your help to trust you a little bit more, even though I do not see it. And um, there was one other passage, that one story that God gave us to, to read um, which was the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. And these two men um, went to deal with an army that looked like the sand of the sea, two of them. And God asked us to read that story over and over until he, we had almost memorized it. And he asked us to put our names in that, in that slot. So let me just let me just read the the um the the passage the point where God asked us to put our names, and He said, and that's for Samuel fourteen verse six, and Jonathan said to the young man that the young man, okay, it's, and Jonathan said, okay, sorry about that. I'll read, I'll read it from 2 Chronicles, verse 14 first, and then I'm going to read the first Samuel. This is the, it's the same story, but let me read it. And I entered, I, and I'll read it first without our names, and then I will read it um, with our names. So, and Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint, no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And so we read, and we, we said to each other, and my son was there, and my, my husband, and all of us were reading it, and I said, come. 
let us go to speak to the owners <laughs> of these lands. May it be that the Lord will work through us. There is no restraint to the Lord to um, provide those land with many people or with a lot of money or with few people and very little money. And we said, Lord, we accept this as, the, as, as you asking us to go forward. And we ask you in a mark and special way to use us, not just for, for the purpose of this outpost, but to reach these people as well. And um, this was, um, this was the, 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 the process that we went through. And when we finally spoke to the owners, they asked us to basically make an offer since they had offered um, the rest of the remainders of their, their estate as well. And um, we said to them, we said like, Lord, I don't even, Lord, we don't even know. These numbers are not <laughs> the numbers that we are accustomed of dealing with. How, what, what do we say? And I said, okay, let, let's just, um, I'll just give this particular figure. Um, just because we don't want to be disrespectful since they're already being so nice and they already give us a, a very, it's already low as well as it is. So we can't really be any lower than this especially when they're adding um, so much more to it. And um, I said, we'll just go with a higher price. You know, let's go with this higher price. And then my husband's like, no, I want to put this low price right there. And I'm like, no, 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 that is disrespectful. We can't do this. We can't give somebody such a low number. And um, he said, well, I'll, I'll pray about that, but you can give the, the, the number that you, you, if you think is, is, is best um, business-wise, but I'm asking God for this one. And I remember giving that number to the agents and he sending it to the, to the owners. And when he came back, he's like, um, this is actually what I sent. And when he showed what he had sent to the owners, it was not what I had business-wise decided would have been the best thing to do. It was actually the, the, the number that my husband had prayed for in his closet. And I was like, there is literally no way anybody could have known this was a number that my husband had prayed for for the agents who have given a lower number than what I had originally given which is to your detriment to give something lower uh, to accept and when he came back and said that it was accepted I was like wow lord you are basically saying to us that this is not hard for you this is not hard for you to do. And the entire world is yours. And you can still open Red Seas in 2021. So this was a blessing to us. I remember we prayed and we thanked God. And from that time in 2020, when God showed us the property, we have been praying and we have been bringing it to him that he would provide the persons necessary to donate and fund this, this project. It is, a, it is a, God has some big plans in store, some very big plans. And he's, he's said, um, we have already started doing the, 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 the planning, the budget and everything. And I remember um, thinking to myself, Lord, you have us planning and, and you have us buying the tools uh, and all of that kind of stuff. You, you know, you still have to provide the funds, right? So first to be able to lock this in. And it's like, yes, I told you I have this. I have this. So right now um, we are asking for prayers and we're asking for, for those who seek. God is speaking to your heart and this is a work that you want to support. To take it to him in prayer, reach out to us. God has a work for each and every one of us to play. Let us listen to his still small voice and hear what he is saying to us, especially at this time in his history. There is much work to be accomplished. And sometimes you may say, what is my little dollar going to do? Or what is my little $10 going to do? And I'm telling you, every single thing that you give to the Lord, he can multiply. Every single thing that you give to him, he will multiply it. So um, at this moment, I want us to go into a season of prayer. As we pray, not only for this particular 
um, outpost that God is going to set up. But for all those that are about to start up to do God's work, especially in the foreign lands, and especially in other places, and to see God's work finish in our generation, to see him meet those needs in this time in earth's history. And before we, we, we pray, I would just like to read one particular passage before we, we pray that has been an encouragement to us as we go through this, um, this experience. The work of building up the kingdom of God will go forward. Though to all appearance it moves slowly and impossibilities seem to testify against advance, the work is of God and he will furnish means and will send the helpers, true earnest disciples whose hands also will be filled with food for the starving multitude. God is not unmindful of those who labor in love to give the word of life to perishing souls, who in turn reach forth their hands for food for other hungry souls. Desire of Ages, page 370. God knows what is about to, to come in this world. And God sees your your love. God sees the work that each and every one of us is doing. He's not unmindful. Whatever struggle you are going through, and I'm telling you the struggles of, of, of being in ministry full-time, there are, but God is always there. He is the one upholding the hands of his workers, and I want to encourage each and every one who's out doing God's work come, um, in whatever area that you are, I'm just letting you know that God is going to be the one to continue to guide you. I will read one more passage before we, we um, pray and then we can go into our questions. When he designates that a certain property should be secured for the advancement of his cause and the building up of his work, whether to be for a sanitarium or schoolwork or for other branches, he will make the doing of that work possible. If those who have experience will show their faith and trust in his purposes and will move forward promptly to secure the point, the advantages he points out, while we are not to seek to wrest properties from any man, yet when advantages are offered, we should be wide awake to see the advantages that we may make plans for the building up of the work. And when we have done this, we should exert every energy to secure free will offering from God's people for the support of these new plants. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 271 and 272. So God is calling his children. He's calling us to come together and support the new work, the new plants that he has led, he has designated, he has brought to, to, to light so that this work can finish in this generation. So at this moment, I would like to um, see a prayer so that we can open up for questions or comments before we move forward. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, not because there's anything good in us, in and of ourselves. Lord, we come before you because you alone are God. You alone are the majesty of the universe. Lord, every single thing that we see is yours, belongs to you, dear Heavenly Father. The cattle on a thousand hills are yours. Lord, nothing is too hard for you to do. Lord, you will accomplish your work as you said in Isaiah 46, dear Heavenly Father. You have purposed it and you will accomplish it, dear Heavenly Father. But dear Lord, you need the hands and feet. You need us, dear Lord, 
your workers. You need those who are dedicated to your cause. Lord, you need each and every one of us to take on the roles that you have given us. This work cannot finish, Lord, if we do not come together in unity to support each other, playing our part in the ways that we know how. So Lord, we bring up before you, the outpost center for St. Lucia, dear Heavenly Father. We don't yet have a blueprint school. We don't yet have a blueprint agricultural facility and education facility, dear Heavenly Father. We don't yet have this, this, this treatment rooms and the, the entire blueprint plan, Lord. We don't yet have this entire blueprint plan set up in St. Lucia. And we know the heavenly father that we have an evangelistic work to do to reach the cities from outpost centers dear lord we know that there are hung those that are hungry dear heavenly father we know dear heavenly father that those that are suffering dear lord suicides have increased on the island dear heavenly father because persons don't know how they are going to feed their family but lord you have the answers to it all you have the methods dear heavenly father that will bring some restoration to each human heart dear heavenly father at this moment so we ask you in a mark and specially to open up the windows of heaven dear heavenly father and open up this red sea before your children dear lord so your work can be done and the medical missionaries dear heavenly father that has been trained in saint lucia would have this work that they can do to heavenly father to bring souls to you to use the medical missionary work as the entering wedge dear lord to have food in one hand and your word in the other so that lord we can demonstrate your method of evangelism we can demonstrate your method of loving people your method of reaching the hearts of everyone dear lord we ask you in a mark and special way to tell us what our role is to play. And as you do so, Lord, this evening, help us to be obedient to your call and do our part, whatever it is. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for the, um, being with us for the session. I will open up for um, questions or comments um, as we um, share.